Welcome everyone to uh, our session on digital technology and data-led citizen reporting. Uh, it's great to be here uh, with uh, Professor David Hughes. Um, and I will be uh, just presenting a quick overview of our session today uh, and who we are, and then we'll go straight into a presentation uh, with, with David. So um, uh, just to explain who, who we are, uh, my name is John Mundy. I'm the Emergency Response Manager uh, for Mercy Corps Ag Agrofin in East Africa uh, with Desert Locust and COVID-19 emergencies. Uh, professor David Hughes is um, with us, who is the professor in the Department of Entomology and Biology at Pennsylvania State University and also leads Plant Village, which is an artificial intelligence based uh, program for climate change adaptation with farmers in Africa. And uh, unfortunately, Elias Nure, who is uh, our project manager in East Africa and regional technology expert, uh, and formerly uh, with ATA in Ethiopia. He was going to feature today, um, but uh, was un unable to join uh, due to some unforeseen circumstances. Uh, so you just have John, uh, myself, and David uh, today. Uh, just a quick uh, note about Agrofin and who we are. Um, we work uh, predominantly with uh, 14 million farmers in, in 130, with 130 partners in, in Africa, mostly in Nigeria, Ethiopia, Tanzania, and Kenya. Uh, our goal is to um, improve income, productivity, and resilience uh, uh, with smallholder farmers through digital financial and information services. We work with a range of public and private sector actors, uh, and uh, we um, try and work with digitally enabled uh, services, um, uh, bundle of services for smallholder farmers, reaching, uh, reaching many different uh, uh, value chains. We, uh, as a response to desert locust and COVID-19 crises this year, uh, we've developed some short-term uh, quick responses, information campaigns, uh, citizen reporting efforts uh, to cite desert locusts and other initiatives, uh, thanks to the Skoll um, and Cisco foundations. Uh, and our core, core funding is from MasterCard and Bill and Melinda Gates foundations. Uh, so with that, I'm going to turn straight over to uh, David Hughes, who has a, a presentation about our work <coughs> on locusts, uh, and then uh, I'll come back with my own presentation and we'll wrap up with some Q&A. Okay. Great, thank you so much indeed, John. It's a, it's a real pleasure to be here and to share um, what we've been doing uh, through Plant Village at Penn State in collaboration with Mercy Corps and then a host of people on the ground in order to tackle this critically important problem of the desert locust. And so it, it, it's a problem we're all rather familiar with, but I think it, it kind of helps to uh, re-see some of these iconic images that we've sort of seen in the news media in the course of 2020. So here we have uh, 14 star hoppers uh, moving up a tree. So desert locusts are this um, literally biblical species that we, we've been battling for thousands of years. It's a single species of insect which uh, stretches during break breakout years from Mauritania and West Africa all the way to Northern India and sometimes even into Nepal. It covers 20% of the world's land mass. Uh, normally, on, under, under non-outbreak conditions, it is a solitary insect uh, in, in the desert areas, as the name implies, uh, moving around uh, in, in, in single uh, individuals. But then when conditions occur to promote a large amount of vegetation, then we see outbreak conditions. And what this means is that the conditions are suitable, the numbers increase, and as the numbers increase, the locusts run out of food. And that switches a change in their behavior, it's called a behavioral polyphenism, and they change from being solitary to being what's called gregarious. And it's at that stage they move en masse in large numbers. And some of the videos here, for example, Lake Turkana uh, back in February 2020, or here in Isiolo County in Kenya, uh, where we have literally billions of insects uh, moving over the landscape. And, and these billions of insects, in, in one case, uh, there was a swarm which was uh, 40 kilometers wide, and that swarm was going to eat enough food um, that would feed 80 million people in a single day. 
Uh, so really, really terrifying uh, circumstances uh, to be presented with if you're a smallholder farmer in East Africa and you can see some of these uh, stills here. And it's not just farmers, of course, uh, it, it's oftentimes uh, pastoralists who are on the front end of this invasion. And so what we were trying to do was figure out ways in which we could help the desert locust crisis and provide a, an actionable tool. But before we kind of explain that, let me um, uh, go back to some of the issues that we have um, with, with desert locusts generally. So it's a, here, here's a map showing 26,000 records collected by UNFAO. And FAO is, uh, is, is the frontline agency for, for desert locust monitoring across its entire range from, as I said, West Africa to Northern India. And they do this through dedicated officers. Um, they've got the mandate to do surveillance for desert locusts. And here we're looking at a map for 26,000 records collected between 1985 and 2019. And this is a um, high human resource uh, intensive effort, which uh, also uh, requires a lot of money and funding. And it happens in the frontline country. So there's a, a dedicated group of individuals who move across the landscape looking for these small outbreaks and trying to coordinate control as soon as possible. And as you notice here, here are all the historical records, the 26,000 of them, and Kenya didn't have any. This was uh, one or two records in 2007 where they came across the border, but largely it's a country that hasn't seen a major outbreak of desert locusts in about 75 years. And so therefore they didn't have the frontline agents in order to do the proper surveillance that's required. On the 28th of December 2019, as predicted by FAO, the, the, the swarm started to move across from the Ogaden in Ethiopia into Kenya, and then they spread to about 26 counties across the entire country in a very short period of time in early 2020. And it just kind of reflecting back on the information that was coming out of the time through both national, uh, regional and international newspapers like the Daily Mail, uh, New York Times, etc. There was a lot of uh, doom and gloom and, 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 and prognosis which were uh, really quite catastrophic uh, because Kenya was not a country that was used to desert locusts and therefore didn't have uh, trained personnel. And, and if you look at all these dates as well, they're from early 2020, and that coincides with the WHO declared uh, pandemic on March 11th. And so the desert locust crisis in East Africa was a crisis within a crisis uh, because COVID shut down travel from FAO, for example, in Italy into East Africa. It shut down travel from other countries with more experience into Kenya. And it also shut down travel between different counties within Kenya, even, even though there was a sort of a, an ability for uh, locust officers to move. Um, but, but generally, COVID made things very, very difficult. And, and of course, it also made things hugely difficult in terms of the supply chain. So getting a lot of uh, pesticides which were coming in, particularly from uh, China, or, or also machinery that we needed, such, such as the sprayers or even airplanes, this was all made much, much more difficult by COVID, as one can imagine. And so Plant Village is uh, a partner of UNFAO through a, a memorandum of understanding. We're a long-term partner. We, we organize the um, Fall Army Worm tool across over 60 countries. Uh, we have another tool in the Middle East for red palm weevil. And because we have used these AI-first platforms with uh, uh, phones on the ground, because we've been well used to working with FAO, they asked us in January, if we could do something. So we rapidly developed a desert locust surveillance tool for non-experts and um, we worked to deploy crisis teams. So I'll speak about those two elements that Plant Village was able to do early on in this crisis. So the normal model, so here's Keith Kresman, who's a senior locust officer at FAO. The normal model is this um, surveillance system that relies upon well-trained individuals who are well-resourced and then have the ability to connect with expensive equipment to satellites. So you're in the middle of uh, uh, very remote areas looking for locusts and you need to get a satellite uh, um, reading in order to accurately determine where they are. And so we approach this uh, it, with the mindset though that in East Africa, there, there's two things which are available. Um, 
one, one of our smartphones and you're these boda boda taxis. Um, so we could get young people out into the field easily and we could equip them or, or have them just use their own existing technology or what's available in the community like these boda boda taxis in order to do broader surveillance. So Frank Doyle of Plant Village developed this uh, eLocus 3M app that we developed for FAO. And critically important, it was able to turn a, a regular smartphone into a tool that would operate in, in, in remote locations in northern Kenya, or Somalia, uh, Ethiopia, et cetera, where it could directly connect to satellites. And that's what you can see here. You can see the tool which is and, and the satellite inputs which are coming down. And so this was really important because historically you would need a very expensive device uh, to directly attach. But now we could just use the ubiquitous smartphone effectively. The other thing that we, we, we historically relied upon was uh, deep domain expertise in, in, in entomology. So as an entomologist, uh, it, it takes time to build up this experience. And Keith Cressman has worked for FAO for 30 years. And, and, and obviously he and the people he trains are really good at diagnosing the different stages of the desert locust in order to accurately record what's happening. And so we approached the problem by providing pictures to uh, some of our field staff, like Tyson here, who's got this wonderful selfie with a locust, uh, some pictures for Tyson to be able to accurately identify the stages so that the records are as good as they can be. But we went a little bit further than that because we have this experience in, in artificial intelligence. So what we have on the back end here is the, the ability to take these images from uh records created by people like tyson into the cloud system of plant village and then run a a convolutional neural network a, an ai program on them in order to accurately diagnose and this is some work that's really been pioneered by pete mccloskey and rohit uh, gangupantulu uh, who are both ai engineers at plant village and i can just kind of uh, exit the show and show you this. Um, hopefully you're still seeing my screen. So this is the live platform that you can see and, and, and here are records that have come in in the last couple of days from Somalia, Ethiopia, and Kenya. And we can also show records which are just people doing surveys. But this particular record here that you can see that came in today in Somalia, uh, if I just click on the image and, and maybe on first glance you think, well, what is this? But if I could zoom in, what, what you can see is that they're immature stages of the of the locust. See these little tiny things here? These are these are hoppers. Um, and that's probably second instar or even well, probably second instar hoppers. And so what what's possible there is the machine was able to diagnose this accurately. So it's 99% accurate or 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 it's confidence, it's 99% confident that these were indeed hoppers. So the AI tool is able to very, very accurately diagnose the problem, which is, uh, which is phenomenal because in this case, we are massively upscaling the ability of people like Tyson to act on the front line and then you know, have, a, have an ability which is comparable to, to the experts like Keith. Uh, and so this is one of the great things that we've learned from 2020 and the Desert Locus operation is that technology can bring individuals on par to to the expert system that we had historically. So uh, another thing that we've done is, is um, get people out into the field who can do this surveillance. So, so recall in, in terms of COVID, what the WHO chief said is you cannot fight a fire blindfolded. And this is the same for uh, locusts as it is for COVID. And the approach of Plant Village is to leverage uh, young people in Africa, particularly from the universities, because we're a university. So this is Dr. John Chalal, and this is the dream team, uh, which have been set up and now being replicated across Kenya. And we have this uh, system whereby uh, incredibly smart young people from agricultural universities have the job with Plant Village to work with local community members. Um, these are predominantly women, uh, over 80% women, and 100% less than $2.50 a day. And so, and so they do this uh, participatory learning and research and education with these community members. So that was our, our existing model. And because we had that model, we can transpose it rapidly into these locus crisis teams. And so this is bringing us back to March and April 2020, when there wasn't a lot of surveillance going on. And these young people across four counties in Northern Kenya were trained. We had about 62 of them. They would go out and they would look for locusts here. 
they would engage with community members and because these young people came from the same community there was a high trust relationship so they they engage with the pastoralists across Isiolo, Sambura, Marsaba, Turkana and elsewhere and and they got local observations because of course the pastoralists are out there uh, uh, moving across the landscape and have great records on where they're finding the locust. They also used uh, phone calls. Uh, pastoralists are largely um, illiterate. This is a Samburu, for example, 88% of the population is, is on less than $1.70 a day. So the educational levels are low, but, but they were able to just call them and get uh, uh, observations. Because they moved on these um, boda boda taxis rather than these uh, four wheel drives, they could go lots of places that the four-wheel drives couldn't. Um, and then they made their reports. Uh, and they, the way in which we closed the loop rather nicely was that they were also in real-time communication with the airplanes that would ultimately spray. And so this is a true internet of things. We have the, the phone, the AI, the cloud system, but also closing the loop with, with um, guiding the airplanes about where they have to go to more effectively spray. So this was something that was a, a great benefit of the system and, and something that we're really happy to see emerged. So uh, we also um, wanted to engage a broader community, not just uh, community members in, in the counties, but also the international community. So what you're looking at here is our, is our Locus uh, board, a, a GIS, a Geographic Information System platform that brought together experts at NASA, uh, NOAA. NOAA is critically important because of wind models, which are important. ISRIC, which, which does soil databases and grow intelligence in the private space. And this is something that we updated daily. We still update daily. And a lot of people find value of it uh, coming and seeing the benefits. Uh, we're able to, for example, look at uh, locusts which are in the egg laying stage, so the mature females, and then using NASA satellite observations and soil data, determine whether we think the area that we find those locusts is suitable for breeding. Locusts require moist, sandy soil to breed, and we can now remotely determine that. So uh, it's really a great advance to see this great interaction among scientists in the cloud, uh, effectively helping people in real time in East Africa. I'd also to kind of draw your attention to uh, the number of observations we've made with the platform since um, uh, since March or in April, uh, almost 18,000, and, and the number of observations made since 1985, uh, almost 25,000 for swarms. And so this is really great. This democratized tool, which is in the hands of young people uh, and scouts across the whole region, is really changing the way in which we can approach and effectively uh, do surveillance. So, so all of this data we're just coming in, of course, is incredibly rich. Uh, we can combine it with things like the soil moisture I mentioned, the soil types, lat long, historical records, crop growth, and weather, and, and work by uh, Dr. Fei Zhang at, at Penn State and Plant Village and Derek Moore uh, also at Plant Village at Penn State uh, have been using uh, machine learning models. So, so the core, so kind of stuff that's kind of ubiquitous on the web and, and figuring out how you search or navigate in the city that sort of technology can be effectively apl applied to the problem. And this is a map from during the, the peak of, of problems in Northern Kenya in June. Um, we were in some areas um, about 90% accurate in determining where we're likely to find locusts uh, based upon these variable data inputs. So again, more data, better predictions uh, and better understanding. So we're not constantly in crisis mode. One of the effective ways, and John will speak more to this, is to engage a broader community. So we've worked with um, uh, Shamba Shape Up, which is a very popular TV program by Medea Company in, in Kenya, reaching about 9 million people a week. And then since that, through, through actions of Mercy Corps and Elias Nure, uh, who was to be on the call here today, uh, we've really expanded into Ethiopia as well. So we're actually collectively reaching about 15 million farmers a week in East Africa on alerts, uh, showing them what the um, what the problems are, showing them pictures, and then also showing this kind of mapping system as well. So everybody can see what's happening on a weekly basis and then the narrator. And this is a very well trusted uh, mechanism to exchange information. Um, so that's really excellent to see. We were able to reach a broad number of people. And then also asking the community members to text in if they've seen reports. Um, uh, you know, there, there's some limited knowledge we get with text because it's just characters, but still it helps guide what we want to do and, and how we might kind of uh, mobilize some people with the more advanced technology, which is a smartphone app. 
Um, and we're not stopping there. So this is work that uh, one of my students is doing, uh, Edward uh, Amoa, and then this is Melody and who, uh, Jeptu, who has run the whole crisis team in, in Kenya. Here we're using these little trackers here, which are now uh, so small, we can stick them on the back of locusts and track them. And in some cases we've seen, we've tracked swarms over 20 kilometers. Uh, and this is really, really excellent because as you can imagine, controlling locusts across the entire range of East Africa is, is very hard. Uh, it requires a lot of air, airplane fuel. It also requires spraying, which oftentimes is um, uh, sprayed in the wrong place or on a swarm, which is not as not a large swarm, it's only a small swarm. So if we use these trackers, then we can figure out where's the largest swarms and, and how can we effectively spray them? And so we get the most bang for a book, uh, so to speak. So in conclusion, um, you all know this, you all used uh, technology to get to your, your current location. We're all using technology now in, in this presentation. If you're moving around a city, you're, you're being guided by satellites. This technology that guides you uh, in a city can guide surveillance across East Africa. Um, and we've absolutely shown this. So it is completely, it has a complete ability to level the playing field, to make young people in Africa comparable with professionals. And the whole model up until now is bringing Europeans or, or Americans into Africa to be the knowledge experts. And that model absolutely can and should change because technology has leveled the playing field. So that's a really important uh, message that we, we kind of come to a conclusion. And the other reason is not just because it's equitable and, and the right thing to do to empower uh, young African scientists to, to do this or just young African people. The other reason we should do this is the crowd is bigger, cheaper and in more places, um, especially when we consider broad problems like climate change. We have to leverage a crowd. And, and John will, I'm sure, speak to this in, in a moment. Uh, many ways. And, and again, this is what John is going to say. And, and the other thing I would say is that 2020 is not yet done, although we're all sort of done with 2020, it's not yet done. Um, so we immediately rolled from the crisis of locusts into this uh, La Nina effect. Uh, so the, the short rains in, in uh, East Africa are well, well below normal. Um, so we're expecting a lot of stress between now and middle December. And we're also expecting uh, for the long rains in 2021 to be way below normal as well. And so we're taking the approach that we had for locusts and we're transposing that in for the pastoralist community. So now we have actually uh, activity across all the northern counties in Kenya for pastoralists. And just to add insult to injury, uh, the locusts are back in Kenya. So this is from the 15th of November, where we see a swarm has moved across from Somalia into Kenya, and we're going to expect more and more of that. So we have massive, massive amounts of, of, of activity here, probably undocumented, also in Ethiopia. And so although we have successfully uh, controlled somewhat the, the problem, it still remains, and it's being compounded by the climate change stress, which is uh, low rains at the moment in, uh, in East Africa. So with that, I'll, I'll conclude and uh, thank uh, an enormous team of people. Uh, Melody and uh, Jeptu has done a phenomenal job organizing this across all counties during the time of COVID. Dr. John Chalal, uh, Moy University, also excellent. Uh, Annalise Keyes, our executive director who oversaw the whole operation. Um, the 62 Locus team members who are just really phenomenal. Our engineering team of hoodies, our partners at Mercy Corps, Medea Company, Turn IO, FAO, World Food Program. Of course, governments are critically important. We really um, have worked very closely with both Kenya and Ethiopia on this. And then funders, as John mentioned, the uh, Skoll Foundation, uh, Schmidt Futures, and then core funding from, uh, well, Schmidt Futures and the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and FAO. So uh, thank you very much indeed for your time and attention, and I'll hand over to John. Thank you thank so you. much, uh, David, for that uh, wonderful presentation uh, about the uh, Plant Village uh, efforts on, on Desert Locusts. Um, and I'll, I'll try and be very quick with my uh, section of the presentation to allow for as many questions as possible. I see quite a few have come in already. Uh, and so you may see me skipping through my slides. Uh, and as, as uh, David has already covered, uh, this arrival of a, a dual threat uh, for African smallholders um, of desert locusts and uh, the COVID-19 pandemic uh, threw up quite a unique challenge um, 
for for development actors and and governments and many others uh, and especially smallholder farmers um but also uh raised the potential um for digital technologies to play a part in re the response effort um the uh, desert locust in kenya had not been seen for 70 years so our first priority was to make sure that farmers were rapidly informed about what these uh, these new um, pests were um, how to uh, respond to them and then also to make sure that scientists like david and and fao and, and the community who were in charge of spraying the locusts uh, knew where they were um, and this this process was made ever more complicated by COVID-19, which in earlier this year really restricted movement and also where people thought we could really uh, deploy field teams or FAO and the government could deploy field teams. So initially the worry was how do we get people out there quick enough to monitor these, these locust swarms so that these maps could be created and the response effort could be supported. Um, that's really where um, we came in with with David, his team, with some technology providers, with um, our relationships in the government of Kenya, uh, with FAO, uh, to see if we could um, deploy digital technologies where uh, information was not flowing from rural communities um, and to open that up. Now, I must caveat this and say to say that field teams with FAO and the government have been deployed since and, and, and effective efforts were deployed. Very good uh, eLocus 3M surveying system with Plant Village with their dream team was able to move around in the end. But initially, our worry was it was not going to be possible. And so we thought, how can we deploy digital technologies, WhatsApp for business, SMS, uh, call center support uh, to build kind of almost a uh, citizen reporting uh, army of smallholder farmers so they were able to report the information. We had, uh, which is something we'll discuss at the end of this uh, during Q&A, uh, we, we had a lot of concern in the initial stages about data sharing. And you'll see this come up uh, with digital technology responses to any sort of um, fast moving issue or even day-to-day uh, -day agricultural issues. Data sharing is a critical component of, of the um, the solution. And so we uh, ensured with FAO, with David, that the data would remain in a secure data area within Kenya uh, and then also be fed into the same system in eLocus 3M within the same database as FAO in the government of Kenya so that everyone had transparent access to farmer data reports alongside uh, their extension reports as well. Uh, so just to briefly discuss the technology that we deployed um, with, with everyone. Uh, we, we sort of ended up taking a, a, a dual response as well as uh, a, a kind of a mass uh, media and uh, a, um, all, all technology under one roof kind of approach. Um, we had uh, TV uh, and, and SMS uh, messaging campaigns from media and Shamba Shape Up, as David said, they were key and critical partners in this. We had uh, WhatsApp for business, which I'll show you in a moment. Uh, we had radio campaigns in Ethiopia across five different regions in five different languages. Um, and all of this was broadcasting new information about desert locusts, as well as basic uh, practices for COVID-19 prevention in farming communities. Um, and this is how we ended up reaching such a large, large number of farmers, 14 million farmers. Uh, but also this was to serve as a call to action for farmers to report via the various channels uh, made available to them on their mobile phones, sightings of locusts uh, to inform the effort. So the public information campaign through TV, through media, had a, had a re really critical purpose in in the call to action, not just informing the general public about what these new, you know, swarms of 20, upwards of 20 million locusts were. They're very scary when you first see them. So, you know, most people will just want to know what the, what are they? What are they going to do uh, to my crop? And then how do you respond? And so the, the TV campaign by Media was critical in this process, but also provided a farmer feedback loop. So the maps that David was preparing in as a result of the eLocus 3M data and his teams uh, were fed back into the TV shows uh, to Shamba Shape Up, back onto the WhatsApp platform uh, and in Ethiopia, uh, back onto uh, TV and, and radio advertisements about almost like a weekly weather report. Uh, this is where locusts are today. This is where we think they're going to be. This is the highest density of locusts. Um, and if you're in this area, please uh, report if you see them. 
this is a, just a quick uh, two screenshots of the Kenya channels, the Shamba Shape Up hotline hosted by iShamba and Medii. Um, the WhatsApp for business platform enables um, thousands or hundreds of thousands or millions of people to use one phone number to access a menu of information about Desert Locus, about the do's and the don'ts, uh, but also um, uh, an ability to report Desert Locus sightings uh, and the ability on WhatsApp to drop a pin location, which is critical for GPS uh, and mapping, and then a photo to help verify that that is indeed a locus and on what stage of maturity um, it was. On SMS through the iShamba platform, very similar, um, but in this case, just text-based. Many farmers don't have smartphones, so we, um, with uh, iShamba, made sure that there was a short code so that those with feature phones could um, SMS this information. And again, all of this information was going into the same database through data David's team with the extension agent data, so a lot of cross-referencing was allowed to happen. Now, on WhatsApp, in, if you're interested in technology, uh, one, of the interest, one of the great things that David's uh, team is working on is building in AI integration with WhatsApp. And what does that mean? It means that once these pictures come in and the locations come in, the, the machine learning system within uh, Plant Village can get much smarter about automatically recognizing what a locust is and where it is and, and feeding that into the database. That's critical because if we expand this out to bigger pests and disease outbreaks where you may have hundreds of thousands of reports of pests in different locations in different countries. No one uh, organization has enough humans to just sift through all of those pictures and reports. And so it's important that during this process, we built out that functionality. Why WhatsApp quickly? I mean, the smartphone application at 3 Locus 3M is great, but you need to be trained on it and you need to have access to it. Everyone who has a smartphone almost uh, may have Telegram, they may have WhatsApp, but I think it's important if we're building citizen reporting channels to use channels widely available to farming communities. Uh, that's not to say that uh, the eLocus 3M app is is uh, is is not useful. It is actually better for verification of sightings of locusts, uh, but it isn't as widely as av available amongst communities um, as as uh, channels exist that exist with them. We also um, provided this hotline in combination with the Af Agricultural Transformation Agency of Ethiopia, the key agency uh, dedicated to innovation and technology within the Ministry of Agriculture in Ethiopia. Uh, they hosted their own line uh, and have actually been surveying uh, their um, di digital advisors in rural areas um, through SMS IVR and WhatsApp survey platforms. They're getting thousands of sighting reports weekly, uh, which is incredibly valuable for the ministry and the FAO and, and David's team to be able to target eLocus 3M teams to the right areas. As you know, as you probably know, Ethiopia is a very large country. So having that ability to narrow down where uh, where to target um, the, the response was very important. Now I'm going to go to key learnings and then I'm going to get into Q&A because I realize that we're running low on time and there are lots of great questions coming in. Uh, but I just want to say a few things about these digital channels for citizen reporting amongst farming communities. Some of our experiences that in this is that there is no wrong digital channel. We've got to play with everything in this in this context. Anything that could be available to farmers, it's important that we put uh, public information on those channels, such as what is COVID-19, what is a locus, so that they're rapidly informed in these fast mo moving emergencies. Uh, citizen reporting channels like WhatsApp and SMS, they're only as really as good as the response or the feedback to the farmers. You can imagine if you're a farmer and you text, I've seen a locust, you might want to see a text or a map or something that comes back to you and say, thank you for your report. And this is what we've done with your data. And I think the incentives for farmers to share information need to be front and center when deploying citizen reporting efforts in the future. Uh, we're still very much in the early days of using digital technology for this sort of scenario. Um, so many more use cases need to be deployed, especially around other pests and diseases and climate-induced emergencies. Um, data sharing system setups from the beginning were critical, as I mentioned before. Um, you know, daily information sharing between uh, the, the different partners, especially government and uh, non-governmental actors, and having all of those standards in place and protocols in place from the beginning was essential. And then just a last thought, uh, farming communities really are on the front line of climate change. There are 
many emergencies uh, this year, even with the uh, La Nina drought and uh, other uh, pests like full army worm uh, last year and this year being a real issue. And and we we need we really do need to deploy as many of these technologies as possible. Um, so with that, I, I realize I'm rushing a little bit, but I want to get to Q and A. And I I've set up some of these questions uh, from uh, from our, our side, but I see that there have been many good questions coming in uh, from uh, the audience, and perhaps uh, it would be best if we start with a few of those. Um, and so, uh, David, I'm going to ask you a quick uh, two questions about the nature of Locust, just so that we can make sure everyone's informed out there. Um, the first question is, I'll do two questions in one to you, David. Do lo Desert Locust have a natural predator? If yes, can we not just think about a biological control? And then the second question is, what can farmers do to protect themselves against desert locusts? Is there anything to prevent locusts from coming or once they're tackle them once they've arrived? Sorry, David, you're on mute. Thank you. There are many things which eat locusts, particularly promising is a fungus um, called metarhizium, which is specific for the, the locust. And that actually is, is now developed into a commercial tool um, where, where you could then spray it. And the benefit is less pesticides, less off target effects. And also it, it tends to propagate itself, just like COVID propagates itself in air societies. Uh, we could see the propagation of the metarhizium fungus. So we spray it and then the locusts carry it and as they come together, so that's beneficial. M more broadly, of course, uh, as these move in, lots of animals eat them. Uh, but the problem is that if we spray them, then, then we have compounding effects with the pesticides. But the greatest potential is this biocontrol agent and we should use it more. Um, that's really critical. Uh, the second question um, was what, John? Remind me. Uh, the second question was, what can farmers do oh, yeah, to protect thanks. themselves against yeah. desert locusts? So uh, unfortunately, very little. Um, a, a lot of activity, they go out and they, and they try to... Um, uh, bang, make noise, but you really don't shift them on. Oftentimes you break them up. So if you really do have a large swarm coming, there's very little you can do. Uh, obviously what you could do uh, in advance is plant tubers uh, like cassava, which is just generally a good thing to plant in, in the face of climate change, because even if the, the foliage has been uh, removed by the locusts, the tubers will regrow. Uh, you'll still have uh, foliage coming back. But, but, but generally, no, there's not nothing they can do. Thanks, David. Um, I'm just going to carry on asking you questions from the audience because there's quite a few good ones. Uh, please do keep them coming. If there are any more, I, I will call on you. Um, first qu question uh, to you, David, again. Uh, are you also monitoring what is going on in the neighboring countries? Uganda is where I am based. Uh, so do you have any news about uh, Uganda? Uh, and then a second question um, I I'll ask after this. It's about mapping. It's a separate topic. So go ahead. Yeah, we, we, we do have people using it in Uganda. Um, and early on, we had records coming in. At the moment, um, there, there's no predictions. So the, the locusts are really moved on the wind. So there's no predictions that it's going to go in. But if they come in in large numbers into Kenya, then they can go into Uganda again, and we'll have records from there. And, and the same thing with Tanzania. Very briefly, they went into Tanzania also. So we have to we have to really consider, given the uh, great changes in the meteorological conditions associated with climate change, we really have to consider that, that in somewhat all bets are off, that they're going to move. Now, ultimately, if they move to an area like Uganda, which is more wet, then they're going to naturally decline because of, of picking up uh, microbial infections. Uh, but we are certainly monitoring Uganda uh, all the time. Thank you. Thanks, David. Um, there's another question here, which is a really interesting one uh, because it's about tech, which is great. I like tech questions. Uh, we have a mapping project here in Tanzania using OpenStreetMap uh, and Crowd to Map. Uh, we could we could we use the satellite connection you mentioned to improve GPS accuracy? And I'm going to just quickly say one thing and then hand it over to David. My first thought on this is. Uh, and I, I've um, been the country director for Agrofin in Tanzania, so interested to know who, who sent in that question because I can only see anonymous, but I would be uh, very interested to see uh, who did so I could follow up with them directly. But uh, the most important thing at the moment for, uh, for uh, digital response efforts um, like this, obviously there aren't locusts currently in Tanzania, but other issues is geolocations, 
geotagging of farms themselves. Uh, one of the issues that we have is, can we get enough field level data on those farms to be able to then match with uh, the remote sensing and satellite efforts of others? And I think this is a, an interesting common theme across climate change projects in the region and pest and disease responses. But David, you may have some other ideas about these uh, mapping platforms. Yeah, so the question was from Janet Chapman because she emailed uh, separately, which is great, um, and I replied. Um, so so happy to hear more and, and engage with her and, and, and the broader team. Um, so I'm not sure exactly the requirements, but but the answer should be yes. Um, so, so generally, when you're developing smartphone apps, there's some sort of exclusion by Google to prevent you connecting to the satellites, but you can work around that. And so what we've demonstrated is we, we can get those. Now, the great challenge is that predominantly people don't have smartphones and, and it's, it's feature phones. And so we're trying to figure out how to do this with Aishamba, who have 350,000 uh, uh, users of their system in Kenya. And we're trying to figure out how we can geolocate them. And, and oftentimes we ask the farmer uh, automatically through SMS, what's the nearest primary school, for example. And that puts us in a few kilometers. And, and if you think about the cell of, um, knowledge coming in from say precipitation or soil etc typically we get five kilometer radius in terms of precipitation data or forecasts so maybe it's not really necessary to get hyper localized um, and the other thing we're trying to test is if we look at all these individual farms and we look at data on precipitation but also above ground biomass data from from nasa and whopper fa and fao product and elsewhere and sentinel maybe it's actually the, the resolution is sufficient, um, which would be great because then we could automatically onboard lots and lots of farmers through USSD. So we built this USSD system to have a session. So it's probably sufficient. So I think it's a, it's a, it's a, we don't know what the answer is at the moment. We're working very actively on it. The answer to the request is, is absolutely we can work with you to improve the resolution and then determine what resolution is sufficient for, for a good enough answer for most farmers. Thanks, David. We have only two minutes left, so I'm going to uh, just ask one last question um, to to wrap us up. And and if you could respond in in under a, a minute, uh, I'll do the same. Um, what have we? Uh, I'm going to ask the top question. What have we learned about leveraging digital technology in these sorts of emergency responses? And and what do you see the future as for uh, citizen reporting and other pests and diseases? We've learned what was obvious before the crisis started, which is that digital technologies is, is a game changing approach that, that levels approach level, levels the field in the same way people in the north or, or the west can use their home as a hotel now with Airbnb or their car as a taxi. Those technologies en enabled hundreds of thousands of people to change their income flow. Why would those technologies not be useful for millions of Africans to change their access to knowledge? And so it was already known before the crisis, but we've actually been able to use the Locust crisis to figure out the whole system end to end. And the example from Locust is that it's absolutely possible and we do not need to go back to the old model. In fact, we need to expand this technology for all the threats that you've talked about, John, that are coming down the pipeline with climate change. So it's absolutely a, a, a system which has woken us up to the potential of digital technologies to rapidly change Africa in the same way M-Pesa changed the banking system in East Africa. Thanks, David. And I guess my last thought is, is you know, the uh, majority of smallholder farmers now have phones in their hands and it is a low cost, quick way of reaching them with the information they need uh, and, and trustworthy information they need uh, through government, through a myriad of other partners. Um, and so with that, I would like to just say thank you to David uh, for um, appearing today. And uh, sorry, Elias Nure uh, couldn't join us as well. Uh, thank you to all, all of you for joining and, uh, and thank you to our partners.